you'll have to bear with me for a bit because this lesson, though not chosen initially, this for the lesson that I'm preaching on today, actually works very well in our lesson. And so I, I just figured I'd really like to read the appointed gospel lesson, which is from the book of Luke, the eighth chapter. It is a great story. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. And as he stepped out on the land, a man from the city who had, been, had demons met him. And for a long time, this man had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you done with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me any longer. For Jesus had commanded an unclean spirit to come out of him. Many times it seized him while he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackled. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. Now Jesus asked him, What is your name? The man said, Legion, for many demons had entered into him. They begged him not to order them to go into the abyss. So there on the hillside were a large herd of swine feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission, and the demons came out of the man, entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake. And now when the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told of the city what in the country what had taken place. So people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found a man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were very afraid. Now those who had seen it told them, one by one, how the man who had been possessed by demons had been healed. And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. For he got into a boat, and then he returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone begged Jesus that he might go with them. But Jesus sent him away, said, Return to your home. Declare how much God has done for you. And so he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, may your blessing be upon us in our lesson for today as we again reflect on bitterness and healing and forgiveness. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are welcome to take out your handout that is in the bulletin for today. Those again online. Uh, Terry, has it been uploaded? The, the handout is uploaded on our website. Uh, more likely that you got through to our streaming service today through our website at www.holytrinityspgh.com. You should know that by memory right now. But everything that you need for our discipleship classes in the weeks to come are on that site. Already I'm told that we've posted the first lesson on our YouTube channel. You don't have to remember where to get our YouTube channel. You just go to our website. And same thing with all the handouts for this. If you're watching from another congregation, you are more than welcome to take all of the information that we preach or do in our services and use it as your own at your service. We would be very grateful to hear from you if you are. That's the only thing we ask. You let us know that it's being used and how it's going over, we would just be grateful to know that it's being used somewhere else because we are always very glad to offer everything that we have to all of you for free. So I need to ask you again to take out your handouts today, which is uh, entitled Releasing Your Hurts and Forgiving Others. And this is a really painful lesson for today because take a look at the introduction. It is impossible to go throughout life without experiencing some type of hurt, wound, or disappointment, and our response often will lead to bitterness and unforgiveness. As, God, as the people of God, we've been called to a higher walk, and Jesus challenges us to love our enemies and hate those who plot against us. Forgiveness is never easy, but God gives us the ability through the working of his word and his example through the gift of his Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay, these are all good words. That's fantastic. But I will confess to you, we all have those times in our lives where the people, if we, honest to goodness, saw them right now, we'd strangle them as opposed to saying hi to them. And I can tell you, there are at least two or three people in my life right now I am so angry with, I would literally strangle their scrawny necks if I had the opportunity to see them because that's how really ticked off I am right now. Now, I usually don't hold on to things for very long, but sometimes things just keep boiling or bubbling underneath there, and it's really, really hard to let these things go. And especially because they deserve it! I mean, after everything they've done to me, boy, I'll tell you, a little bit of anger coming out here, right? You're in the edge. 
A little bit. All right. It's there, and it's sincere. I'm ticked off. What am I going to do? Now, is there anything wrong with anger? No, because anger is a good thing. Anger protects you from being hurt again. It's okay when somebody hurts you for you to be angry at them. In fact, it's a natural, God-given response. Did Jesus get angry? Of course he did. However, once he, his anger burned, he was done with it. His anger was there to protect him from the harm that other people caused. That's what anger is supposed to be used for. You burn it because you're angry, because somebody's intentionally trying to hurt you, but once it's burned, once you find a way to protect yourself, you've got to find a way to let it go. Anger that is nurtured becomes bitterness, and that's not a good thing. So why should we forgive? Well, there's a couple of good biblical reasons why we should forgive, and then there's some practical reasons why we should forgive. And I'm not saying that the Bible is not practical, but even those who don't accept the Bible as the Word of God are going to have to fall along and accept the fact that forgiveness has got to be the way of life. Look at what the Bible says, first of all. Why should we forgive? Because, oh, I don't know, we've been forgiven first. Every thing and everyone that you have to forgive has already been forgiven by God because of what Jesus Christ has done, and the only people that are holding on to unforgiveness are us. God has forgiven you more than you can possibly imagine, and I can tell you, no matter how badly you've been hurt by somebody, it is nothing in comparison to how badly God has been hurt, but yet God is willing to forgive over and over and over again. And so God is not only our example, our inspiration, but also the power behind our forgiveness. We need to understand that what God is asking us to do, to forgive people who really hurt us, is something that God has done already for us. While we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Do you accept that in the scriptures? Because that's what the Bible says about us. But there's a second reason why we should forgive, because we have been commanded by God to forgive. Look at what uh, Jesus tells Peter. Lord is having this discussion with Jesus and says, Lord, if a member of the church sins against me, how many times should I forgive? So he wanted to know if there's a limit to that. So he could kind of draw a checklist. Okay, he's going to put Bobby's name here, Sue's name here. When Bobby offends him X number of times, he has a right to not forgive him anymore. That's what, you know, that's what Peter's thinking. <laughs> but Jesus says, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. There's another one that says seven times, 70 times. Right? Uh, now, so Peter is saying, okay, so, okay, I've got to have a little bit bigger checklist. But once I get to 77 times, he's done, right? No. That's not what Jesus is saying. You've got to get rid of your checklist and your count about how many times somebody's offended you. Because that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that there's a limit to forgiveness. He's actually saying just the opposite. He's using an illustration. And the illustration he uses is the number seven. For that number seven represents perfection in the Bible. Now, where do they come up with the number of perfection? Because it represents north, south, east, west. It represents the earth, the sea, and the heavens. All the known elements and directions that exist in the world today, or in their world, at least as they thought of it back then, were represented by those seven elements, I guess you would say. Therefore, the number of perfection. So what Jesus is actually saying is, you forgive a person a perfect number of times. As many times as required to bring completeness, wholeness, and perfection. So how many times is that? Seven times? Seventy-seven times? 177 times? 7,000 times? As much as it takes to bring reconciliation in your relationship with somebody else. That's how many times we are called to forgive. We are not to count the number of times that we are forgiving each other. So there's a third reason, and this, I, I kind of don't like it, but it's in the Bible, so we kind of got to say it. We are going to be held accountable for the unforgiveness in our lives. God will hold us accountable. Now, that's not really a good reason to forgive other people. If you're just forgiving because you're begrudging it, you're like, ah, I, I don't really like this person, I don't really, I'm having a hard time forgiving, but I have to because... God's going to punish me if I don't. That's a bad reason to forgive. But I am here to tell you that it's a motivation to find a way to forgive because we will be held accountable if we don't. After all that God has forgiven you, the lesson that's used there to illustrate that, you can read a portion of that 
on the handout today. But it's a story about a very wealthy man whose servant had a million dollars that he had borrowed from the master, and he was not able to repay it. And he begged the master for forgiveness, and the master forgave him. He went out, the servant did, and saw a guy who owed him 50 bucks. And he beat him mercilessly and put him in prison until he was going to forgive, until he was able to get that 50 bucks paid up. And the master heard about it and said, after I've forgiven you a million dollars, and you're not willing to forgive your own uh, co-worker 50? To heck with that. That's the story that's being illustrated there. God has forgiven us a million bucks worth of sins and more, billions of dollars worth of sin. And yet we hold on grudging, uh, hold on with great uh, uh, bitterness to those things that people have done to us. Some of the times we don't even know what they did to us. Oh, I'll tell you, I actually had that. There were actually siblings in our church years ago who wouldn't talk to each other. They had not talked to each other for 20 years. They both came to the church here every single Sunday. And they sat here and received communion, and they still wouldn't walk across the aisle to shake each other's hands after 20 years. Okay? I actually went up to one guy and said, what, what is it with you guys? He said, well, he was an idiot. I went to the other guy. What is it with you guys? He said, well, he's an idiot. I go, well, good. I, I said, what did he do to you? I don't know, but I'm ticked off with him. You know, they literally could not remember what it was that set them off. It was some, some event that happened 20, 30 years ago. They are all bitter about it to that day. And I'm like, well, you know, you're taking communion. God's forgiving you. Maybe you need to go out and reach across the aisle and forgive each other. It's crazy. Did that? Well, yeah, they did eventually, but it was not an easy thing, let me tell you. So what do we do? Let's go on. Those who hold on to forgiveness will be held accountable. But there's another problem with unforgiveness. And this is some of the real practical reasons. If you kind of rejected the biblical reasons for it, let me tell you some very practical, personal reasons about why you need to find a way to forgive. Because an unforgiving heart is going to poison your life. It's going to poison your life. Or harm. It's going to harm you. And I'm going to tell you why. Because... Unforgiveness, remember, anger is a good thing. It protects you, but once you're done with your anger, you've got to let it go, because if you don't let go of your anger, it ultimately produces bitterness. If you keep rehearsing that bitterness or the anger over and over and over again, it produces bitterness. And what happens with bitterness? Number two, bitterness is not natural. It is something that you nurture by harboring your resentments against somebody for 20, 30 years. If you've got something you're harboring for 20, 30 years against somebody, you've got a problem. I know you're sitting here saying, but they hurt me. I don't care. They may have been the instigator against you, but somehow you've got to find a way to let it go. That doesn't mean that you let them back into your life to hurt you again. I want to make sure you understand that. You do not, by forgiving somebody, have to allow them in a position to hurt you again. But somehow you need to find a way to get rid of that resentment if you've been harboring it that long. You've got to stop rehearsing your hurts. How often have you done that? You play that, it's like, a, it's like a movie in your head. It goes over and over and over again. You see over and over and over again what that person's done to you. And then you keep thinking, what would I do differently? I'll punch them in the face first if I had that opportunity again. Don't you do that? Sometimes you change that. You try to change that picture and how you're going to hurt them first if you get the opportunity next time. Uh, you start justifying your unforgiveness. You keep saying, well, you know, again, they're the ones that hurt me. And we develop negative and judgmental thoughts. Have you ever done this? Let me throw this out. I wish I'd had this in here. Have you ever done this? Where you're so angry with somebody, and you know you're going to run across them, and you start picturing the interaction that you're going to have with them, and you start rehearsing more wounds before they even happen. Have you ever done that? So you start thinking about all the things that are going to go wrong when you see that person. And, you're, and, and they just get angry and more angry and angry about something that didn't even take place yet. Yeah, we're stupid like that because we're people. We do stuff like that. Here's what happens with bitterness. Number three, bitterness will, not may, bitterness will 
destroy your life because there are physical effects. Just ask your doctor. There are physical effects. It will literally kill you physically. There are social effects, and we're going to talk about that in the number four. There are emotional effects. It makes you an emotional wreck if you cannot forgive people. You can't let things go. And ultimately, it leads to spiritual alienation. Now, let me tell you, there's nothing that you can do that's going to prevent God from loving you. But there are a lot of things that you can do that prevent you, that, that build a wall between you and God. God can overcome it, but the problem is you build this wall that you just will not cross, and your relationship with God dies. If you've ever had a very cold relationship with God, you wonder where God is, oftentimes God is right there, but you build a wall between you and God so you don't touch God, see God, feel God. It's we are the ones that build that barrier between us and our relationship with God. So if you wonder why your relationship with God suffers, don't look at God. You're the one that's built this wall. You're the one that's preventing yourself from having that spiritual contact with God. So look at number four, and I'm not trying to throw that out to make you feel guilty. I'm just trying to be real with you so that you understand that wall is there. I've got to find a way to get rid of it. Look at number four. Bitterness. Oh, remember I told you there's social effects of bitterness? Bitterness poisons everybody around you. It doesn't just take a toll on you. It takes a toll on your ch children. It takes a toll on your spouse. It takes a toll on your friends. Because what do we do with our anger? We displace our anger, making all of the people we love live in the poisonous environment. So here's the funny thing. This person that, you, that hurt you 20 years ago and you're so angry with, they don't care about how bitter you are right now. You are not hurting them with your bitterness. But you're hurting every single person that you love that's sitting around you. So once again, you're, because of your bitterness, you're taking it out on the people around you. And that's got to stop. Because they don't deserve it. Look at number five. Unforgiveness, and this is where we're going to tie into our lesson that we just heard a moment ago. Unforgiveness allows Satan access into our lives upon which he built a stronghold to control our lives. Now I mentioned that story that we read today about the guy who was possessed by demons. We don't know why he was possessed by demons, but the Bible says this, and uh, also we know this, <coughs> to be true for those who study these things, people are concerned about being possessed by demons. Well, let me tell you, if you're rooted in Jesus Christ, you've got no worries. It's the people whose lives have nothing but emptiness and just are, are struggling and searching and, and, and don't have anything in their lives to fill their lives are completely empty. We are told that that is the case where Satan has a real access point to gain an entry into your life. And so I think about this guy in our Bible story for today, and probably this was a guy whose life was completely empty, like nothing, <coughs> nothing but broken relationships, nothing but anger and bitterness. And those are opportunities for Satan to get a hold of your life. And so we cannot allow Satan in or have any access to that part of our lives. That doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. But let's talk about some <coughs> practical ways that you can overcome this unforgiving spirit in your life. Okay, so take a look. How can you overcome an unforgiving spirit? Uh, you ever heard the phrase, time heals all wounds? That's a bunch of crap. Okay, it is crap. All right. Anybody who's lost a loved one knows that 20 years down the road, you're still crying about losing that loved one. Time does not heal all wounds. Okay, time will never heal our wounds. Only God can help us create something constructive out of our anger, rather than leaving bitterness that can lead to healing. So if you are struggling with bitterness, you're hurting these wounds, you need to turn this over to God, because you're going to have a hard time overcoming this without the help of God. You need to take the opportunity, and oh boy, we looked at this last week, to confess our unforgiving spirit to God, to those who have been harmed by our bitterness, and to those with whom we are bitter. Oh, wait a minute. So let's stop and take a think about this. So, I know I've been bitter. I know there are people that really make me angry. Okay, so i got to confess this to God. I get that. I can confess this to all the people around me that I love, that I'm taking the toll on because of my bitterness. But i got to go and confess this to the person with whom I'm bitter? 
they're the ones that hurt me. Well, I'm outright telling you, I'm not ready for that. I told you I have two or three people in my life right now I'm really angry with. I'm really, I have some source of bitterness. I'm not ready to go and talk to them about that yet. I don't forgive them. I just don't. I'm outright telling you. I don't forgive them the harm that they've done to me and to my family. I don't. So what am I going to do? Maybe let's keep looking. I'm just not ready. Here's the key. Yet. Not ready yet. So how do I make myself ready? How do I put myself in a position for that? Well, I need to ask for forgiveness. Look at number three. Wait a minute. I'm the one that's been hurt, and I need to ask for forgiveness, but I'm the one that's harboring bitterness. I need to ask for forgiveness for that bitterness that I'm harboring because it's hurting my family and those around me. And when I do get to the point where I am ready to see these people, I need to go and, oh, this is hard. I need to tell them and apologize to them for being bitter with them. Is that what I just said here in the lesson? I'm not liking this. Wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not appreciating this too much. Yeah, you know, if I'm ever going to have a good relationship, now there might be some people with whom you're bitter that you finally forgive, but you're never going to be able to have a relationship with them, and I get that. But if you ever want hope of a relationship with them, you've got to find a way to overcome your bitterness, and yeah, you do need to seek reconciliation with them about that. And when you do, and I have had people where I've been bitter with, and, I, and yeah, they legitimately have hurt me, but I need to overcome my bitterness towards them, I need to go and apologize to them if I'm ever going to have a good relationship. I know, I'm the one that's been hurt, but I've got bitterness in my heart against them. I need to ask them for forgiveness for that bitterness. This isn't sitting well, I know. This is the hardest part of this. So that means when I go up to them and I see this person, and we'll say, I'll pick on Joanne, or I say, Joanne, I've been really bitter about you, what you did to me like five years ago. And I'm hoping you're willing to forgive me. Because after all, you were wrong, though. You really hurt me. No, that's not what you're supposed to do. You don't use an apology to pile on somebody. If you're apologizing, you just apologize. I'm sorry for what I've done to you and for bitterness in my life. Because I don't want this to be a barrier between us again. Now, she's got her own stuff she's got to deal with. But I can't use an apology as an excuse to pile on to her stuff. Now, I say this with the understanding this may not be true in, every, in some relationships. You will never be able to reconcile this way, and I get that. But if you want hopes of having a relationship with somebody who's hurt you, at some point you've got to also apologize for your bitterness against them. Look at number four. Seek help. Help from others. Have others pray with you and for you. Do something constructive with your anger. Oh, this one I love. Uh, Kathy Lee Gifford, I love this story. Kathy Lee Gifford would often talk about, you know, being somebody who's in a public eye, there were always people who would criticize her, criticize her family, say nasty things about her. When she was on Broadway, oftentimes she'd be in a play and she'd get these really horrible reviews that would attack her personally. She said, it was one thing when somebody had, says, I just didn't think it was a very good show, she didn't do a good job. But it's another thing when they get really personal with them and it starts to really hurt. And she said she could sit there and become really bitter about this very quickly, but she decided that her constructive thing that she would do to help overcome her bitterness is any time there was a critic who would say something that was really, you know, slight and, and personally offensive, or any time somebody would say something publicly or somebody would say to her something to her face that was really hurtful to her, she would go home and she'd write a check, a couple hundred bucks, she'd rip it off, She'd send it in the name of the person who hurt her to that person's favorite charity. So that that person would then get a thank you letter saying, thank you, Kathy Lee Gifford, or Kathy, it's not Kathy Lee Gifford, Kathy Lee, uh, uh, Regis and... That's her name. Kathy, Kathy Lee. Name. Kathy Lee Gifford, yeah. So she would send, uh, she would send, she'd write a check, and so that person would get a thank you letter, thank you, yeah, Kathy Lee has given a donation in honor of you to your favorite charity. Very twisted, but I love it. <laughs> it was her way of overcoming some of her bitterness about this. It worked uh, for her. her way of putting a stick in it. 
Well, it could be, but it made her feel better. It anyway. could demolish No, she was doing brain. something constructive with her anger, and she, but she meant it because the last part is the most, I think, important part. I'm saving the best for last. You need to fill your life with godly thoughts. Um, because it's easy, again, just to fill your life with all those rehearsal of all those wounds and so forth. And here's the thing. I, you know I told you? I'm holding on to some of the stuff that I have against a couple of people. I'm not ready to forgive them. I really seriously would probably punch them in their face if I saw them. I just am so angry with them. Well, one I'm particularly really angry with. The others I probably would be quite that bad. But the one I'd like to just punch this person's face if I saw them strangled. Okay? So how do I overcome this? I'm not ready to do that. If I were to see them in a public place, that's probably what would happen and wouldn't go down well. So here's the key. Pray for your enemies. Okay, God, I'm praying for my enemy that you would strike her dead. Oh, no, that's not what it says, right? Pray for your enemies. Not for God to change them. Here's the hard thing but for God to bless them and to change my attitude towards them. Remember, bitterness is killing you. You're looking at this, and I know what you're saying. This person has really hurt me. I understand. I've been very badly hurt myself. But me holding on to my bitterness is not doing me any good, and it's not doing my family any good. I need to find a way to let go of that bitterness Otherwise, it's going to kill me and kill my family and kill my church and my loved ones around me. So I have to pray for God to bless this person and to change my attitude towards them so that I can let these things go. I may never have a great relationship with a person again. I have to protect myself. It's okay to protect myself. But I have to find a way to let this go to get this bitterness out of my life. I'm going to tell you, um, this is another true story. We actually had a woman in church who was really bitter with me for like five years. I know it was a five-year period of time. I noticed that this person was very friendly with me for, for the first years of my ministry here. And all of a sudden, one day, the next day, a Sunday at church, I came up and said hi to this person. Wouldn't talk to me. Hi. Hi. Whatever. Just really dismissive. Five years, this person wouldn't have a conversation with me. I'm like, what in the world? And I go up and, is everything okay? Is everything okay? You know, on and on. Finally, one day, she, you know, I said, is everything okay between us? Well, you should know. Uh -huh. uh, no, sorry, I don't know. You know, I obviously don't. And she's, well, then you don't know, then shame on you. Oh, boy. Five years I put up with this. And I had no clue. Finally, somebody came up to me and told me, well, do you know what you did? I said, I haven't a clue what I did. Are you ready for this? Okay, in church, in the receiving line, if you know in our traditional service, I shake people's hands as they go out. So I'm shaking people's hands. And she walks up, wait a minute, she walks up and she walks behind me because she's tired of waiting in line. She walks up behind me and walks out the door. And I didn't say hi to her. Did you have those eyes in the back? Your yes. Closed? She was bitter with me for five years for ignoring her, for cutting the line and walking behind me. And that's what she was ticked off with me about. And so I finally went and talked to her. And all, but I said, I heard you're upset with me because you ignored her. Well, yeah, I can't believe it. Blah, blah. I said, you know, I don't even remember that day. This is five years ago. And I can guarantee you I don't just ignore people. But that's just the way things go. You know, but she was hanging on to that for five years. And it killed my relationship with her. We needed to overcome that. And so I, I actually told her, I said, well, somehow you need to forgive me. Because, and I need to forgive you. Because I don't know why this is. I had nothing against you. Well, that's where we get to number seven. We need to start rehearsing forgiveness. Not our hurts. Because forgiveness is a process that's learned over time. I told you right now, I'm not ready to let go of some of these things that are annoying me. But I know for a fact, in time, I will. I'm much closer to that today than I was six months ago. And six months from now, this probably won't even matter to me anymore. The bitterness that I had held on to. 
But the reason why is because I'm being proactive about the bitterness. I'm praying about it. I'm praying for God to remove that out of my life. I'm praying for God to restore it with forgiveness. These are tough things, right? But I want you to use as a motivation the one thing that's most important that God has first forgiven us while we were yet sinners. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today knowing that we're holding on to bitterness against people. Sometimes it's long term, sometimes 20, 30 years. Sometimes we don't even remember why we're bitter. Sometimes we're bitter for very legitimate reasons. People have really, really hurt us in a horrible way. I don't think that we have to allow those people back into our lives in a position of harmings again. But for the sake of our health, for the sake of our family, those that we love around us, we've got to find a way to stop spinning in circle and remembering the same thing over and over and over and over again. We need to find a way to release these hurts and release this bitterness in our lives. So we're praying, God, for those with whom we are bitter right now. Not that you get them, God. We're praying for you to bless them. And we're praying that you help us to change our attitudes so that we might be healed. For it is in Jesus' name we give thanks and praise. Amen.